We're now going toward healthy brain. And our first speaker is Dr. Alan Altman, who's our local Aspen-based expert on sexual dysfunction and menopause. Dr. Altman was also previously, I think, 30 or 35 years at Harvard and Boston. But he's now our local man, and we're so thrilled to have him. Alan stars in Heidi Houston's film, Hot Flash Havoc. If you all haven't seen it, it's very, very special, very important. It's just been, it's, Heidi produced it locally. Alan's one of the experts. And it's now been taken up by PBS. It's a fantastic film, important for women and men to see it. Uh, Alan's going to talk to us today about new findings that are able to see sex in the brain. And he asks, is the brain our dominant sex organ? Alan, please. Thank you very much, Glenda. Uh, I try to tell Glenda that usually you eat after sex, not before. Uh, secondly, secondly, <laughs> Jerry. Um, secondly, she has given me 18 minutes to talk to you about sex. Most people have sex for more than 18 minutes. But nonetheless, let's move on. I've lost my sex drive. That is a new complaint over the past decade or so that we are hearing in our medical practitioner offices around the world, around the country. Uh, and it's a very large problem, and part of the reason we're starting to hear more about it is because we're talking more about it in the media and all other kinds of media, magazines, movies, and certainly the internet. What's happened here is that medical science, at least the clinicians who are presented with this complaint, are ill-equipped to deal with it from two points of view. First of all, from a time point of view, if you say Are you having any sexual problems and the tears begin to come down, that clinician is there for the next 45 minutes. The whole rest of the schedule is totally screwed up. So we can't do that. Secondly, I, when you go to a super specialist like this, we will spend 60 to 90 minutes with that patient. That's a totally different story. But also in spending the time, the knowledge is not altogether there because this is a relatively new area of sexual medicine. Anyway, what I do want to point out to you first is when we talk about a sexual dysfunction, a sexual problem, there has to be distress about that problem with one or both partners. Anything I'm saying this afternoon has to do with both heterosexual, homosexual, whatever kind of relationship you're talking about. If there's distress, then it's a sexual problem. Let's start with the basics. This was Masters and Johnson, who gave us excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. They showed us what we were doing. Kinsey documented all the different things we were doing. What Masters and Johnson did was to say what our bodies were doing while we were having sex. And they divided the phases of sexual response into the four you see on the left here. Excitement, which was somewhat nebulous, followed by plateau, orgasm, resolution. Plateau is the height of excitement and, and strain before the release of orgasm. If you think of when you really, really have to sneeze badly, right before the sneeze is plateau and the sneeze is orgasm. Usually somebody sneezes at this point. What Helen Singer Kaplan did to the phases of human sexual response was make them far smarter. What she did, she took this nebulous phase of excitement and divided it into desire and arousal. Desire and arousal. Desire was in the brain. You got turned on, you wanted, you had hunger. 
Arousal was the brain saying, okay, let me get this straight. When we're eating, I send blood to the gastrointestinal tract. So if we're going to have sex, I better send blood to the genitalia. That way he can get an erection and she can get wet. Okay, that's very basic. So we have desire, which is central. We have arousal, which is peripheral in the genitalia. She got rid of plateau because nobody was sneezing. Then we had <laughs> orgasm or satisfaction, followed by resolution, meaning the time it takes to get back to be able to do this again, which is far quicker in women than it is with men. Go figure. Anyway, this was a linear progression Step one, step two, step three, step four. Well, women are just a tad different. And what we're looking at here with women is the biopsychosocial cultural model of female sexual response. And there are all these interacting circles. Yes, certainly, there's the biology, hormones, blood flow, things like that. But also, there's the interpersonal. We don't have sex because he won't take the garbage out on Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> this is extremely important. There's also the psychology of the individual. Is she just having sex for him? Are they one person? Have they not been able to differentiate the two of them? That's a little complicated to get into now. What about the sociocultural? What are, what are the things that we see in everyday life driving? What, what do we see on billboards? What do we see on the internet? What do we see in, in the magazines? What are the pressures to have sex? Young people get married and they think everybody has sex with wall banging noise and stuff going on because of what they've seen in the movies. So it's different for women. And instead of this linear progression of Masters and Johnson, which describes male sexual response and some female sexual response, we now have the intimacy-based model of female sexual response. And what this is, instead of step one being that sexual hunger, Many women start in sexual neutral. This is going to hit home in a minute. <laughs> they seek out emotional intimacy. They want to be intimate with their partner. They don't have this sexual hunger, I want to tear his clothes off. They're just reading a book and, oh, hi, how are you? then they allow themselves, they become receptive to sexual stimuli. Still no turn on. And as they become receptive and they become stimulated, they become aroused. And as they become aroused, then they access desire. Gee, I like what I'm doing. I'm going to keep doing it. This is extremely important. They don't have to have the initial sexual hunger. Anywhere along this cycle, sexual desire can take place. And this is extremely important because when I see a patient who says, I have no sex drive, she might indeed have a sex drive. What do we mean by that? We mean that sometimes desire is not spontaneous. It's in response to becoming aroused. Let's read this. A woman will frequently, but not always, start sexual activity from a position of neutral without any sexual hunger, but once stimulated, her desire will subsequently be triggered by the arousal she experiences. This is referred to as responsive desire. In essence, women's desire is often responsive to stimulation and does not precede it. So right away, 60% of the women who come to my office complaining of no sex drive have sex drive. They just don't understand that it's labeled that way. And if she knows that if she initiates this, even though she just as soon read a good book, and she knows that there's going to be an end to it that's pleasurable, why not? You don't have to have that initial sexual hunger. This is a very important concept that I want to leave you with today. Now, how do you make a picture that explains this? 
I can just show you this picture and walk off the stage. And many people who see this picture point out to me that the male switch is always lit and is always facing upward. So women's desire can be spontaneous or responsive. It's so frequently based on the length of the relationship. And yet spontaneous desire can always return with a new partner, but I think we'll skip past that. <laughs> I do wanna let you understand that no matter how many women you ask, no matter their ages, approximately 40% will say they have some sort of sexual dysfunction. Most frequently, that is desire. But you see in the last column, the percentage who have distress over that problem is about 10%. I could argue that, and I'm happy to, but much later, because we don't have time for it. Everybody says, go see this guy, he'll give you testosterone, which will stimulate your sex drive. And they're not wrong. You know, women produce testosterone that peaks in their 20s and starting from the late 30s on begins a very gradual age-related decline. Men do the same sort of decline. There's no abrupt loss of hormone like there is with menopause in women. Testosterone is gradual. But who cares about testosterone? It's a male hormone. Women cannot make the natural estrogen, estradiol, in their ovaries without first producing testosterone. So without testosterone, there ain't no estrogen. Testosterone is very important, not only for sex drive, arousal, orgasm, but it's also important for energy level. It's also important for bone and muscle health. And most importantly, it's important for mood. Mood, okay? That's testosterone. Even the ovaries after menopause, where the ovaries have stopped producing estradiol, they still produce testosterone. So if your ovaries were removed previously, postmenopausally, every morning when you open your eyes and wake up, you're half a tank down because 50% of that testosterone postmenopausally comes from those ovaries that don't longer make any estrogen. So yes, testosterone is important, that's part of this picture, but it's not the only part of the picture. Let's talk about the brain. The major sex organ in human beings is the head. In women, it's this head. <laughs> Jerry's really getting a kick out of this. And I really want to explain to you, in the brain, we have neurochemicals, and I'll point out to you what they are. But these neurochemicals are both excitatory to sexual desire or inhibitory. And it is the balance that depends on what the final product is. And what we have found over the last decade, and this is really quite interesting, is that all successful therapies, no matter what therapy it is, including placebo, Psychological therapy, couples therapy, sexual therapy, hormonal therapy, or medication, relatively new medication, all of these therapies work by changing the balance between the excitatory and inhibitory neurochemicals in certain regions of the brain. What does this look like? You see on the left here, this is HSDD, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It's a fancy term for low or absent sex drive. And you see with the low or absent sex drive, the inhibiting neurochemicals are heavier. We've got to find some way to stimulate the excitatory neurochemicals to turn this around. Okay, let's look now at sex on the brain. Amazing studies what we look at functional MRIs and we look at the blood flow in these areas of the brain that are involved with sex. And what's fascinating is how do we see sex turn on in the brain? We show women erotic videos. Makes sense and it works. But when you look at an erotic video, 
You're moving your eyes, you're watching it. And just eye movement can stimulate areas of the brain. So we've got to show them other kinds of videos, hence athletic videos, where women are playing basketball or soccer, where the same eye movement is there, but in normal cases, the erotic isn't there. So we do each of those, we subtract the athletic from the erotic videos, and we're left with the pure sexual response. Now what we do, we look at women with a history of a sexual problem, low or absent desire, versus women with no history of it. And we look at activated areas in the brain that actually light up, as I'm going to show you, but we also look at deactivations. What do you hear about that? Okay, first off, take a look. Can you see this? No, you can't. Right over here, these three MRIs, and you see all the orange and yellow, and you don't see that over here. This is the woman with the history of lower absence sex drive versus the woman without that history. Let me show you a little bit better. This is here, healthy female volunteers watching erotic films, and you see the lighting up here and here. You see it throughout, but what I'm going to do is go back and forth. This is the woman with the sexual problem. This is the woman with more increase in blood flow. This is the woman with the decrease in blood flow. Next. These are deactivations. In order to be able to activate the sexual parts of the brain, you've also got to deactivate the areas of the brain that take away her sexual focus. You all know what I'm talking about. During sex, she's lying there thinking to herself, I got to pick up the kids in 25 minutes. <laughs> or, gee, the ceiling could use painting. My point here is that those areas being active take away from her sexual focus. So not only do we have to increase the activity area, we got to decrease certain areas that take away that sexual focus. And you see here, these are deactivations. Look what happens to them. They're gone. Again, deactivations. Look what happens. They're gone. And thankfully, you've heard a bit about this, neuroplasticity in the brain. The brain can relearn things. So when we see the decrease from normal to acquired problems with sexual desire, when we see the decrease over here with appropriate therapy, and remember I said any kind of therapy that works, we will restore that blood flow. The brain will relearn to do this. So there's hope. There's hope. Now while we were learning all this, we started working with a drug with a long name called phlebanserin, that happened to increase the excitatory neurochemicals and decrease the inhibitory neurochemicals in the brain. This was kind of interesting. And it was happening in the brain areas that we were studying. And sure enough, we studied this in 11,000 women over the past decade and a half. And just last summer, this non-hormonal medication became approved by the FDA for lower absence sexual desire not caused by any other factor. Now this is not female Viagra or a sex drug like the media has called it. In fact, if you look at the real sex drugs in men, which are Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, these are what we call episodic medications. I want to have sex, so I'm going to take a drug to help me. It's episodic. Phlebanserin is something that needs to be taken on a regular basis, kind of like thyroid medication or an antidepressant. It's taken every night because it can make you sleepy, so you take it at bedtime. But the key is it's not really a sex drug. It works over time. If you don't respond with an increase in sex drive in eight weeks, this is not for you. 
but it's not for everyone, and that's where sexual medicine specialists can help figure out who would benefit from it. Also, at the bottom here, it can be used in combination therapy with psychological therapy, sex therapy, or couples therapy, which may take a year and a half and squeeze it down to maybe six months because of the addition of this. Okay, so not having sexual desire is only a dysfunction if it causes distress. Many people are perfectly satisfied to no longer have sex in their lives, and nobody's pushing them to have to have it. For those who are distressed, we've got many options available. And what's so fascinating, we see how all those options converge in a specific way in the brain to enhance the excitatory neurochemicals and diminish the inhibitory neurochemicals. Lack of spontaneous sexual desire, remember this, is not necessarily a problem if responsive desire is present. So that initial sexual hunger doesn't have to be there. And of course, the future is what we are seeing in the brain with these responses. And if I had hours and hours to talk about it, we could learn a hell of a lot more. So let me thank you so much for your attention.